Well, thanks for coming out, everybody. I, I guess you saw our technical difficulties were sorted out. It's, is that straight enough for y'all? Yeah. yeah, so thanks to all those folks. Um, yeah. But uh, my name is David Campbell, as you've heard. Um, I've been working as a botanist for about 25 years for North America. I'm from Canada originally, but that's about 20 years ago now. But I've done botany from the Great Lakes region all the way down to um, Georgia, Costa Rica, some in the United Kingdom. So I've been at this a little while. But uh, the Polk County project, it's funny you should mention the uh, magnolia. That was sort of initially what kind of got me thinking when I was looking at some of these odd records, these sort of disjunct coastal plain Ozarkian plants that you find in Polk County. And I wanted to learn more about it just as a professional botanist. And I started reading the literature, which some of you are probably familiar with, by Cull Ross PD uh, going back, which I still utilized. It was very helpful. Uh, Doug Rayner's report from the early 90s, which is uh, excellent as well. But we found that there was no real comprehensive county inventory for Polk County. And of the 100 counties in North Carolina, I think when we started this, 95 of them had been done. So this is kind of like a jewel in the crown region for botanists in the Carolinas, which I'm sure you already know that. A lot of interesting stuff. So without further ado, I guess I'll get to the good stuff. I won't blab. So is that dark enough for y'all? Oh, good. And as our eyes adjust, if y'all have any questions, please just put your hand up whenever and I'll answer them. It's very, I'm very informal about that sort of thing. So I hope I can advance this. Let's get to this. I have a question. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That were done by Doug Rayner? Or done by anybody. Oh, South Carolina immediately adjacent to, like where we're at now, you mean? Sure, or Greenville County. I'm not so f up to speed on the South Carolina Natural Heritage Program sort of databases. I mean, I, I've, I've certainly consulted and run around this area. Cull Ross Petey mentioned some things from this region. I, my impression is, for what it's worth, is that North Carolina is maybe a little bit more organized um, about the county inventories in South Carolina might be. Um, I think there's a lot more basic field work needed to be done maybe in this part of South Carolina than North Carolina. I could be totally wrong, by the way, but that's just sort of what I, the impression I get. But certainly, if you take away the political boundaries and the state lines, in many ways, the, the natural area here is kind of a contiguous thing that in some ways would make sense to kind of lump together even. But such is how it is. Okay, so as I was saying about the inventory, so we'll get to the good plant pictures in just a sec. So what was the point of it all? Why did we do this? Land managers need to know what's out there. It's real basic bio-inventory stuff, like what do we have in Polk County? Where is it? How much of it is there? and so on. And of course, we do communicate our findings with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, colleagues, a natural heritage program, and that sort of thing. And as I was saying, it brings Polk County in line with the rest of the state that's had these sort of inventories done long ago. So how was this done? So consulted scientific literature, natural heritage program databases, talk to colleagues, reach out to landowners through the Polk County's most wanted, which thanks for the plug there. <laughs> I, I hope you all enjoy it. I, I write one of, about one a month. It's usually a plant. I try, I don't know if you notice this, but I try to try to time it so that once you read it, you might actually be able to see it soon thereafter. Right, that's, I think the last one I did was Cecropia moth, because you can find the cocoons now. So I try to make it so you can put it down and go, oh, maybe I can see that. Sometimes I don't, sometimes I don't do that. But we, we haven't run out of anything yet. So here's... Um, a nice photo of an Indian paintbrush by my friend Keith Bradley, who I'm sure some of you know. I've got a few of his pictures in here, too. Uh, and that's an example of one of the articles. Interesting story about Indian paintbrush. It'll come to play here in a few minutes. Uh, Call Ross Petey, There's his specimens are, many of them are deposited at uh, Chapel Hill Herbarium. And uh, he did collect Indian paintbrush in the region back in the 20s near Tryon, not too far from the um, present day railway station area there. I, I went to the area, it's been since sort of wiped out. But um, that's the kind of plant that wherever you find that, you'll definitely probably find something cool with it. It's an interesting thing to find around here. So 
going from left to right, you know, we select the sites. How are we going to do this? Sometimes people will say, oh, come to my property. I've got some cool stuff. And you go out there and it's kudzu and, <laughs> so, you know, and you say thank you very much because 99% of the time as you're walking out of there disappointed, you'll find something cool anyway around here. So I visited the sites and as you can appreciate if you think about it, you know, if you go to a site at this time of year, you might be able to kind of discern that it could be worth coming back to later, but you're not going to see much. So I tried to visit some of the sites or most of the sites at least a couple, three times, you know, early spring, midsummer when it's stinking hot and everybody's inside, uh, and the fall. And then, you know, we sort of type out the community types. For North Carolina, we're now at about 400 identified natural community types. That's a lot. And so I've spent a lot of time trying to find the congruency between what I'm seeing and what the other gurus or whatever think I should be seeing. So that's always interesting. But lots of hours spent, most of it fun. Um, so what do we get? Found a new species of vascular plant that needs described, and I'll go into that here. Lots of new county and state records. Um, dozens, many hundreds of herbarium specimens, some being sent to USCH, Chapel Hill, Clemson, UNC Charlotte, the regional herbaria, we like, you know, we'd like to speak to one another and communicate and exchange specimens. So it's not of much use what I do if I can't communicate with y'all, you folks, the public, other scientists, or it gets lost. So let's get to the good stuff, right? We all know what that is, don't we? So that was on Tryon Peak. That's a nice bunch. We know what that is? Cypripedium. Parviforum variety pubescence this week, right? They changed that up. But it's always, whatever you call it, it's beautiful, isn't it? Okay, so here's a neat one that some of you may be familiar with. Um, you can see in the photo I've got there that I took, there's pine needles in the background. I, that was intentional. Sweet pine sap is one of our earliest flowering, late winter flowering plant species. Usually detected by the nose, right? Um, I've spent countless hours on all fours in the woods trying to find it. And on more than one occasion, the police <laughs> did come. I'm not making that up. And I kind of think, who are the people that call? Right? Anyway, so if you see a middle-aged white guy like me on all fours in the woods, it's probably bad. Right? Let's be honest. But in this case, it was. I was just getting my plant geek on, right? So <laughs> the way I sort of liken this is, you know what a ventriloquial sound is, right? This is like a ventriloquial smell. You'll think, oh, I'm on it now. I've got it, man. And then you can't find it. And they're just poking up through the duff, right? And so it's like, I'd say nine times out of ten when I smell this, I never find it. I never find it. I think one time only have I found it by sight when I was like, ah. You know, you get lucky once in a while. Once in a while. But prior to this, it hadn't been seen in Polk County for decades that we knew. It was a report, I think, Sugarloaf or somewhere where somebody wrote, I can smell it, but we can't see it. That's what the end. Yes? What does it smell like? To me, it smells like cloves. And when I think of this plan, I think about like a warm day in late February as you're going over a ridge. A pine, it likes pine oak heath, acidic. It's always, in my experience, with um, things like Virginia pine, Table Mountain pine, uh, mountain laurel, sort of the classic ericaceous stuff and you'll just smell it coming over the hill or something and you're like, I know it's here. I know I'm not going to find it, right? <laughs> and that's not, now I don't know if you can tell from the flowers, but it's, it's definitely related to blueberries. Yes? Is it only bloom once a year or is it blooming in the fall? There's several fall walks off, I think I smell it. Well, you're not alone in that. So um, I smelled it one time in the fall and I think um, taxonomically back in the day it was considered a variety, they called it Lehmannii, so Monotropsis odorata var Lehmannii. But I think what they've figured out now is it's just uh, an early spring plant trying to get a head start and some weird weather systems come in. And so it's not different, but I've smelled it once. So if you've smelled it, then you're probably not imagining. Um, but again, often they flower before they even poke out of the duck very much. Once they're pollinated, um, They'll, they'll extend, you know, their, their seeds and stuff will be further aloft than the flower, I guess I could put it that way. Until recently, we didn't know what pollinated this. Does anybody have a guess or know what pollinates this now? Ants. Good guess, but no. What, what might be one of the few insects abroad on a warm late winter day? 
bumblebees, exactly. And so I was in Catawba County, and I was in a Virginia pine area, mountain laurel, classic site, lots of pine needles, and I could smell it. I mean, I knew I was between here and say where the computer is almost from me, and I couldn't see them. And I know what they look like. I've seen them dozens of times now. And I was getting fed up, and then I saw a bumblebee. You can see where this is going, right? And queen bumblebees hibernate over the winter. They, you know, they're, they're fertilized in the fall, and then everybody dies, and they crawl somewhere and sleep all winter. And so any bumblebee you see in the early spring is always a queen, so definitely don't want to kill those, right? Or any bumblebee. And so I followed her, and within 35 seconds, zoop, she led me right to it. And I thought, oh, it is bumblebees. So, But again, these are plants that don't photosynthesize, right? Related to Indian pipes, pine sap, that kind of thing. Very interesting group. Um, a Southern Appalachian endemic, right? Tip more or less this region. I don't think it's as rare as people think, but it's not common. Uh, and if you're not out of the right time of year, and if you don't know what you're doing, you just, you're not going to look for it. But keep your eyes peeled. When it comes out of the duff, I find it's maybe three inches, a couple three inches, um, depending on when you find it. The, the older it gets, it's got a purple st sort of uh, stem that's not very obvious there because of the brown leafy bracts around it. But even on herbarium specimens, I had some in my car that I forgot I had. And it made my car smell like sweet pine sap for like six months. Yeah. It's really strong. Yeah, in a nice, good kind of way. Um, but definitely a, a really great species to keep your eye out for, like, in the next six weeks, you know, if you're in the right habitat. Hmm? Yeah, I always find it with, I've, I personally have never found it without pines being present, but you all know what it's like with nature, They're, they don't read the book, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of the time I saw Isotria medialoides, you know, small world pagonia, it's like our rarest orchid north of Florida. And there's one plant that grows in a lady's backyard in Greensboro, North Carolina. Whatever. <laughs> so, but in my experience, yeah, it's got to be pines. Mountain laurel is always somewhere nearby. But blueberry, you know, huckleberry, all that kind of stuff. And I do think it benefits from fire. I know an area in Burke County, North Carolina, that burned over in the 80s. And it regenerated to 100% table mountain pine. And then one spring in the duff, I saw thousands of them. So. I think fire. This one's a classic, right? Do you all know where the Childers Tract is? Some of you? Um, just outside of Tryon, there's this great place if you don't know where it is. It's just down the road, I guess, from Pearson's Glen. And um, Conserving Carolina owns it, I guess. Pacolet Conservancy got it. But it is, um, according to Dr. James Matthews of UNC Charlotte, he says it's the richest forest in the Piedmont he's ever seen. So if you ever want to be blown away by spring ephemerals in Polk County, you've got to go there. Like the, it's called the Childers Tract. And um, it's, it's, you know, there's not a lot of parking. You could, if you blink, you'll miss it. Um, you can park maybe a couple, three cars there and some on the road. It's near a bridge. And you go up in there and it's just full of, you know, some of these, this was taken there. This was on a boulder. There was just some. Uh, it's been reported for Polk County but not seen for a long time. This is something that some of you may know is commoner to the west of our region. But uh, the basic soil, you know, the more circumneutral soils in our county provide, I guess, a home for this. Is that the bridge past Pearson's Falls when going towards Saluda? No. Okay, no. You got to go. Everybody here has to go. I just, there's probably more Trillium simile there than anywhere in the world I've ever been. I mean, it's, there's, I mean, there could be 10,000 trillium simile in there, and I'm not exaggerating. So you're going to lay a field trip? I, I can do that for you. I can do that. Yeah, it's a good one. I've, I've led trips there. So allied to this is the next slide, of course, Dutchman's Britches, right? That's all over the place at um, the Childers Tract as well. And what's neat about this to me is some years it flowers everywhere, and some years I've been, I haven't seen any flowers. It's growing vegetatively fine. Perhaps, I don't know, energetically, maybe it takes a lot of oomph for it to flower. I don't know, but uh, it's neat seeing that with the preceding species right next to each other, of course, because they're in the same genus, right? Can you tell them apart by the leaves? I can. Don't ask me to explain it, though. <laughs> you know, British botanists have a saying, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's called the jizz. Like you get the, you just see it, you know it's different. 
And then people roll their eyes and go, yeah, well, sure. But it's a thing. It's a thing we know. Sometimes, you know, sometimes I don't know what I'm talking about, believe me. Here's one I took a picture of um, near Columbus. Large world pagonia. That's always a nice one to find. It's also kind of cryptic. I consider this like April, maybe mid to late April. And it also sort of favors acidic situations, Pine Oak Heath, maybe some disturbance, a power line cut or a roadway. It's easy to miss. There's only two orchids in this genus, and this is one of them. Yeah, it's an orchid. And there it is front on, just sort of the leaves are just starting to kind of get bigger. And you can kind of tell by the lighting that the canopy hasn't really leafed out, can't you? It's very bright. And this, you know, this is an uncommon orchid. I, you know, it occurs in the Great Lakes region in um, bogs like um, black spruce and tamarack bogs, habitats we don't have down here, but it does share the acidity with our habitats. Sometimes I find it with pink lady slippers. And you can spot the lady slippers much more readily. So if you're in an area with pink lady slippers, Remember what I'm telling you and look around, because you can, you can miss this quite easily. Here's its rare cousin, small world pagonia. That photo wasn't taken in Polk County. That's from uh, Burke County in South Mountain State Park, where the largest population in the southeast is, and it's 33 stems, that's it. That's it. And uh, as you can see here, this one's double flowered, and the one in the background single flowered. And uh, usually these will bloom around May 19th. That just seems to be the day they like, sort of third week in May. Um, the one in Greensboro had three flowers on it once. And this is one of these orchids that's, uh, I guess the fancy word is mycotrophic, you know. It's got its sort of roots in the ground and it's got its sort of association with fungal hyphae and all that good stuff. That's why digging this up and putting it in your garden is completely fruitless. Plus, it's an endangered species and you'd be in trouble. Everybody knows this one, right? So again, at the Childers Track, for example, there's a lot of this. this. To me, I think of this as a floodplain kind of thing, rich soils. I mean, I've seen it flowering at the end of February. And uh, at the Childers Track, I saw one yellow one among hundreds of these burgundy ones. And of course, I get excited. I know it's not Trillium luteum or Discolor, but in this region, you never know. So I always look at it, but it was just one of these that came yellow. But these are always nice to see. David, yes? Does this population have that uh, sweet, uh, spicy smell? Or is you know, this is one of those plants that people tell me it has a smell, and I don't seem to be able to smell it much. So maybe you're right, it's the population. I didn't smell it. But some people tell me they can't smell sweet pine sap. And I'm like, why, how can you not? So it might be us that's different, but on the many occasions I've tried to smell these, I don't get much out of it. These would be pollinated probably mostly by flies, I would think. A lot of flies hibernate. Flies are really important pollinators of a lot of native plants. And I guess the theory would be the kind of funky smell would attract them, or the color. The mottled color in the red might remind them of something decaying. I don't know. This was one we just found uh, last summer along the Green River. This is an uncommon spiderwort, Tratiscantia virginiana. And uh, Dr. Matthews and I were just going under a, a fence, again on all fours. Here we go again, right? And uh, I was like, hey, that looks like Tratiscantia virginiana. And it was. So I took a picture of it. Here's Trillium simile at the uh, Builders track. So a lot of people would mistake this for a white trillium erectum, you know, the red trillium. It's one of the pedicillate trillium. Pedicillate trilliums, it's got a stem for the flower, right? But note the dark ovary and that kind of 3D effect of the petals coming out at you kind of. But this is definitely not something you run into in many places. Can you see the dark ovary better now? That's a good field character. And if you want to photograph that to your heart's content, the Childers Tract. There is some at Pearson's Glen growing in seepage. But again, one never knows what's been put there and what is just there. But they're not far from one another, so they could be just part of one large metapopulation, I guess. 
Here is one we rediscovered for Polk County and it was actually designated as historical in occurrence for North Carolina. So it had disappeared from North Carolina for a few decades, been reported from Polk County back in the day and I think Henderson County maybe. You can see the ovary on this is not dark. It's quite different. This is a trillium with a pretty wide distribution. I mean, you can even get it up into the Great Lakes and areas like that. So we were excited to rediscover trillium flexipes. And of course, it was growing in rich woods with, you know, trillium grandiflorum and Betsy and Kate's Beach trillium. There was probably about six or seven trilliums all within about 20 feet. It's pretty amazing. Here's the rose-colored variant of Trillium simile you don't see too often. And you know, our trillia are kind of, do any of you have Frederick Case's books on the trilliums? It's a good book, isn't it? And you know, depending if you're a splitter or a lumper taxonomically, sometimes I scratch my head at some of these new combinations, but who knows? I mean, you know, there, there certainly could be some undescribed species hiding out there. Southern nodding trillium, are you familiar with this one? Trillium regellii. Every time I find this, it's near spice bush. It likes sort of sweeter circumneutral alluvial soils. I find it usually on um, upper terraces of floodplains with maybe like sugarberry and spice bush, flowering maybe second, third week in April. And if you don't look carefully, you won't see the flower. That's why I gave you this funky angle here on purpose, right? If you're looking down on them, you, you might not see any flower at all. So if you're in an alluvial area with spice bush in the spring and you see trilliums flowering that appear not to have flowers, you might luck out and find this because it's not a common one either. There you can see the anthers. There's a similar species up in Indian further north called Trillium carnuum, and they used to be lumped together but the northern species has, I believe, gray colored anthers and some other differences. That seemed to be a split that made sense. Piedmont ragwort, anybody ever seen that one? Yeah, where, where did you see it? Yeah. Rocky area? Yeah, sometimes to get pictures of this, it's kind of scary the places you might have to go. Some of these, that doesn't, that looks like it's somebody's rock garden, but it really wasn't. Um, but this is another special thing of our region that's not, not common at all. And you've got to sometimes risk life and limb to get it. Blue Ridge Bittercrest, that's another early spring species. Much favored by things like uh, falcate orange tip butterflies. They lay their eggs on mustard family plants in the early spring. And again, sometimes those butterflies have led me to stuff like this. I'll see them. And I'm like, I'm following you. And sure enough, there you go. Is that one that's purple on the underside? This has some purple on the underside early in the spring. I think it's probably anthocyanins for the cold weather maybe, like a lot of plants have. But this likes typically mucky seepage areas. It's, it's, it likes it wet, pretty damp. Cuthbert's turtle head. This is something that likes sphagnus, acidic, boggy seeps. The rarest turtle head of the four we have. A very interesting distribution, sort of cocoa plain, and then skips to the Piedmont, then some in the mountains. I may have had a wider distribution, of course, before we wiped everything out in between, right? But it's strongly four ranked. The color on that picture doesn't do it any justice, really. Um, but that's, the leaves are sessile, they clasp the stem. So even if you're somewhere in the winter, you can tell by the twigs if, you're, if you look carefully. That's how I found a population of them once was in the winter. And then I came back at the right time of year and there were hundreds of them. And it was just incredible. But that is one you don't see very often at all. Small spreading pagonia orchid. So this used to be considered a widely distributed species and Divericata, I think, is, was the first species in this group, but that was more coastal typically. This likes pine oak heath, kind of, the kind of places sort of favored by sweet pine sap, actually. When it's not in flower, you'll walk by it, think it's a blade of grass. I think it's rare, but I think it's underreported. But if you ever get to see this in real life, 
Um, it's beautiful if you can look at the labrum, the lip is so much detail there. It's a really, a really nice one to look for. Here's another good orchid for you. Swamp pink, likes the same kind of places that Cuthbert's turtlehead does, pitcher plant bogs, more common at the coast, but occurs in some boggy seeps in our region. Excuse me, what elevation? Would this be? Yeah. For this one? 900 feet. Not, not very high, not very high. And in Polk County, because uh, that's what we're talking about for the most part, the acidic kind of boggy seep areas are typically near the Rutherford County line. Uh, you know, broadly speaking, the further west you go, you get into more mafic rock that weathers into more basic soils that this wouldn't typically like at all. But again, one never know. I mean, you know, I know that this, there's been some reports of this further west in the county, but I didn't see it. But that certainly doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. It's a good question. Here's a Keith Bradley picture because it's a graminoid. That's his thing. Radford sedge, that's another southern Appalachian endemic species. I believe Chick Gaddy, if you know who he is. He uh, described this in the last couple decades. And I believe he named it for Radford because Radford had sort of told him that this would be a good region to look for some new species in. And sure enough, Chris Radford was a guru, right? He wrote The Vascular Floor of the Carolinas with a couple of other pretty famous guys. Another Keith photo. I found this growing, um, if you know where Hughes Creek is, there's a big wetland sort of there as well. And an old dam that's pretty cool to see made out of stone, an abandoned town near there from back in the day. This looks a whole lot like a much commoner sedge called Carex lupulina. But this one differs in the uh, architecture of the, um, the female structures we refer to as perigenia. That's the kind of nerd term. The sacs, the female flowers produce. So just because they don't sort of jump out at you as colorful, some of these plants are certainly worth knowing. Here's a good one. It's one of our hybrid ferns, one of the hybrid splenniums. Can anybody guess at least one of the parents from the appearance of this? Walking fern is definitely one. And the other parent is a Splenium montanum. And so where the two occur together, you sometimes get this thing. And in our region, there are many such hybrids and odd chromosomal combinations. And these are epipetric ferns, meaning they grow in rocks. This one favors more basic rock. Um, Bradley's spleenwort likes acidic rock, and it's another hybrid. And so again, if you slow down and take your time and start looking at ferns on rocks, I promise you, you'll find something cool. It's unavoidable. Have you seen Bradley in I've seen it not in Polk County, but I, I, it's reputed to be here. I believe it, I believe it is, or there, sorry, we're in South Carolina. Um, I've seen it in Burke County on acidic cliffs, quite dry cliffs too. So we saw this picture earlier. That was taken on Round Mountain, which is a, you know, outside of Tryon. This is an early spring flowering orchid. In North Carolina, I think it's probably known from a half dozen locations. It's pretty cryptic, you could miss it. It flowers quite early. Definitely not common though. Is there any foliage that comes up in coral? That's all there is. They don't really have a whole lot of foliage, to be honest with you. Their leaves are more like bracts held close to the stem and that sort of thing. But if there's a good clump of them, they'll stand out. And this is another one that likes kind of circumneutral, sweeter soils. You wouldn't find this in Pine Oak Heath. Definitely not. This was kind of a cool find. This was new for the state and the furthest south record for eastern North America. This was on Round Mountain too, not far from the coral root, everybody here knows Virginia creeper, right? What stands out to you about this one? Shiny, isn't it? And it's not climbing up stuff because it doesn't have the sucker discs like Virginia creeper. It sort of just scrambles over stumps and whatever. But the shininess, this is the creeper you find in the Great Lakes region. And so discovering this, um, I think the nearest known locality was one in Virginia, maybe 300 miles to the north. 
And this was near the summit of Round Mountain. My theory is, is you know, a lot of frugivorous birds will eat the fruit, and they're on, this is on a flyway, and they may just alight on the, the mountain summits and defecate the seeds out. Um, and perhaps, you know, we should be looking on our summits. But getting to the summits is not always fun or easy. But this, was, uh, this is the only known locality we have in North Carolina is this one sort of patch, and it's right in the middle of nowhere. Nobody put this there. So that was kind of an exciting discovery, a new woody plant for the Carolinas, a native one anyway. Virginia marble seed. That is something that you could walk by and not notice. I've even gone to places where I know it is, and it takes me about five minutes to find it. They usually occur in low numbers, like five, six, seven, three. The seeds are really neat. They like, look like little white, tiny cowrie shells, if you know what those are, the hard enamel. Very neat. I think this is another one that likes fire, it needs some, some fire to thin things out, and it likes basic soils. It's a rare species, not common around here. Walter's wing stem. So, neat little story here. You can see the high quality environment by the uh, English ivy in the background. So, speaking of Keith Bradley, this is how I got to meet Keith Bradley. So, I write these columns, as you know, and uh, his parents are like, I wrote about Walter's wing stem because it's one of these weird sort of rayless asters we get around here with a really odd distribution and I uh, wanted to see it. They said, well, we have this on our property. And I was like, oh, great. And so I come up to the property and they have a lovely home in Tryon. And I sort of pull up and there's, I notice that they have these like uh, pitcher plant bogs they've made there with all kind of pitcher plant hybrids. And I thought, wow, these, somebody knows is into plants around here. They've got sundews and Venus flat traps and pitcher plant hybrids. And you know, his dad comes out and greets me and we go around the back and I see this hill covered in English ivy, and I thought, oh, this is going to be another one of those visits. And it wasn't. Uh, apparently, Walter's wing stem is really cool with English ivy and Oregon grape and all the rest. It was just growing up through it, five, six feet tall. There were dozens. They couldn't care less. Now, it might affect how well they, their seedlings do. I don't know. And there was a, some butternut nearby that was producing fruit and wasn't cankered. And, there was um, another rare plant called World Horse Bomb, I'll show you in a bit. It was growing there, and I thought, well, that's good. That's a good thing. David, yes? Right after your column came out about that? Uh-huh. Was that last year? Or last I think it was a couple years ago. Was oh, did you? Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, anytime you find this, it's a good, good find. It's not common. Um, but. You know, the Bradley said, you know, our son's a botanist too. And I said, oh, is he? So we became friends. It was kind of cool. You just never know what will happen. This is not a good picture. It was taken with my smartphone. But uh, pink thoroughwort, it used to be called Eupatorium incarnatum, I guess. Now it's Fleischmannia this week. Maybe next week something new. But the flowers are pink, hence the name. But at least my crappy photo shows the deltoid leaves. See those leaves? Those are distinctive and odd. And this is not a common plant at all. Um, and these ones are just grown by the roadside. It's like, pull over. There were 200 of them just kind of there. So you just, again, you guys know, you never know where you find stuff. Around here, it's, it's so rich and botanically diverse, you can find stuff anywhere, even in English ivy, apparently. Here, and here we go. That was growing in the English ivy, too. And uh, uh, one of Polk County's sort of special plants you don't really find anywhere else in North Carolina, although there's reports of it now from Rutherford and other areas, but this is our rarest Collinsonia. This one's kind of neat because it's all white looking. Usually I think there'd be some pink in there, but maybe it's the age of the plant or the way the picture was taken. Something like that. Pale purple coneflower. So this is kind of an interesting story. Uh, along railway tracks. So kind of problematic in that railway tracks have a lot of waifs, right? A lot of botanists will turn their noses up at things because railway tracks often have invasives. But this was also growing near big blue stem, little blue stem, and Indian grass, and less than a mile away from Col Ross Petey's Indian paintbrush collections and some other prairie-like plants. 
in my experience, this plant doesn't spread out of gardens readily and it has fairly narrow soil requirements. So having a population of that in Polk County, uh, you know, we felt pretty okay saying it was a native occurrence. Because railway embankments can often be refugia for prairie plants. Certainly in the Great Lakes, that's the case. So why not here, right? Deceptive spiny pod. You all know Matelia caroliniensis, milkweed vine, if you want to call it that. This one's sort of um, much rarer, likes basic soils again. Can you see how the petals are kind of reflexed and pushed back? That's one of the ways you can sort of discern what it is. If you find this, you'll find other really good things with it. You never won't find good stuff with this. It's a pretty neat species. Big leaf grass of Parnassus. I owe this, this one to Cull Ross Petey as well. So on Tryon, in Petey's writings, I didn't come across this, but there's a specimen in Chapel Hill that he collected in 1920 something. And it said, um, and I can't pronounce this properly, so forgive me, but it's Shunkawakan Falls, if you're familiar with that. And I think it's Cherokee for Skywater Falls on one of the part of Tryon Peak, White Oak area. And he said collected in the pool at this area. So I look in the pool, I can't find it, but I'm like, seeds go downstream, don't they? But boy, oh boy, don't go downstream from there. It's like a really scary ravine that you can die in. <laughs> I'm not even kidding, but I found it there. Yeah, it, it was interesting because it was growing in an area where there were a lot of dead hemlocks, and you know they're all dying from the woolly adelgid. And so I'm thinking, well, the sun may help with some more flowering, but it may dry it out and population will be gone. Um, another common name for this is lime sink grass of Parnassus. It's more basophilic than um, the ones you typically get in higher elevations, a kidney leaf grass of Parnassus. But this is a great thing. I mean, you, I've even found this into November. Likes it wet. Here's another special thing that doesn't look interesting because it's not in flower. But if you look at the name Ozark Bunch Flower, it tells you something about where it, it should be. But this was on Tryon Peak. Um, when it flowers, which I've watched this population for years, none of them have flowered. There's about 40 of them. It's a very rarely flowering thing. But unlike other Veretra, it's got like burgundy or maroon flowers instead of kind of greeny white flowers. And um, in Illinois and places like that, they consider it a prairie species, kind of. Kind of. But its presence here again is kind of odd. Really odd, actually. It's the only known locality. In the well, no, I think Patrick McMillan found some in Jocassi Gorges. But those are the only two we know of for the Carolinas. So we talked about this earlier. And that's where that was from. Right near Columbus, there's um, a little creek. And there's some streamside flats that have things like netted chain fern and cinnamon fern and things like that. And uh, growing in there is Nyssa biflora, which is like a more coastal plain, kind of black gum type species. Laurel leaf catbrier, climbing hydrangea, these sort of coastal plain disjuncts, and about 200 of these. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I suspect that there are other populations unknown to us because when it's not in flower, and if you're not into it, you might not really think much of it. Winter would probably be a good time to look because of the evergreen leaves. But it's here. Do you have any theories, slides there? Well, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, that do you guys not get this around here in South Carolina too at all? Are there not some old records? Or am I way off the mark, maybe? There are some old records from Iredell County um, in Statesville region in boggy areas. I guess. You know, we're kind of in that isothermally belt here, are we not? It's a little bit warmer. It could be one of those things where it just, it's just enough right for it that it can, can make it here. It's not a very satisfactory explanation, I guess, but uh, it, it's here, you know? I got a guy who played in Montreat, North Carolina, and I believe um, oh, really? there were several in the woods there. Really? Well, that may be so. Now, that would be Buncombe County, maybe? Would it? Yeah, I mean, certainly, like our knowledge of the distribution of plants isn't nearly as good as you might think. Yes? When do they bloom? You know, that's a good question. I think, 
June, May, June, early, pretty early. Yeah, it would definitely not be the summer, I don't think. Um, I don't bump into this too much in my line of work because I'm usually in the Piedmont or the mountains, so I, I actually can't recall. But I would think maybe May, June would be a good time. But again, if, you know, Col Ross, uh, Rainer had a population that you'd found near Big Level in Polk County that I went to his site and I couldn't relocate the plants because it looked like there'd been a lot of disturbance. Col Ross Petey found one. Here's more. You gotta know we haven't found them all, right? So keep your eyes peeled. Now would be a good time to look. This is not very interesting, is it? Yeah. Except that it's another one of these things that you know, is rare and not typically distributed here. But this was found, um, not by me, but Pam Torlina found this, I think near Pearson's Glen, but in the woods. And since then, we've looked for it. Mm -hmm. We can't find that, but we found Ambigua. Yeah, yeah. Yep, Ambigu is around, and then there's Montana and a bunch. This one's at least distinctive enough when it's in flower. Ambigu name. Well, here's one you don't want to run into, right? Poison sumac. This is mostly coastal plain, but in Burke County, Rutherford, McDowell, and Polk, and Boggy Seeps, you run into this. And what's, I mean, it's, it's beautiful in the fall. I don't know if you've ever seen it, it's orange. Um, we found a really cool boggy area in the fall by seeing this across a field. And so um, a friend of mine named Bill Moy, William Moy, some of you may know him, he's a, a botanist as well. And he sort of jumped out of the car and jumped over someone's fence, which he shouldn't have, and ripped a piece of it off and proceeded to rub it all over my car door, because that's what friends do. And I was like, thanks for nothing. But then we went to the bog and found like all kinds of cool stuff like iris versicolor and a bunch of other things. And, I don't know who owns that property, but thanks for letting us get on it, I guess. We didn't get shot. So, Nestronia, does anybody know this one? What, what can we say about Nestronia? Well, you, of course, know all of these. I, I can't tell you anything new. Um, what's cool about it? Well, it's separate male and female flowers, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, it's a parasite on, uh, a hemiparasite on the oak. Right. And this is a male plant. Never in my life have I seen a female plant. I've never seen fruit. And it's one of those plants that, um, you know, you've got male plant, female plant, kind of like hollies. But if they're not close together, it's not going to happen. And even when fruit is produced, my understanding is, is there's a fungus now that sort of damages the fruit. Um, I believe Native Americans, um, I think it was named Conjurer's Nut. I don't know if they felt by wearing it, it would bring them good luck in hunting or... Um, that sort of thing. It doesn't look like much of anything. It looks like an opposite leaf blueberry. It's a shrub. It's in the sandalwood family, um, along with things like Bucklea, if you know what that is, or buffalo nut, that sort of thing. The flowers have a heavenly smell, and they're pollinated at night by tiny moths that nobody pays any attention to. So, but look for it. Now that you know, Nestronia. White iris set, that's one of our specialties around here, isn't it? So this is federally endangered. I think Polk County's got to be the heart of its range. I've seen it in Burke, Rutherford, Polk. I, th I think it may be in Henderson, and I think Greenville County has it, right? Um, if it's not in flower, it looks like grass. You wouldn't pay attention to it. Um, but again, another name for its isothermal irisette, that sort of region we're in here, um, that probably accounts for a lot of our oddities, really. It likes sort of um, woods that don't have a very heavy canopy, I find. It likes sort of thin woods and kind of a, not much going on in the herbaceous layer to compete with it. But keep your eyes open for that. That's common, but I just wanted to throw it in there because it's so cool. Right? I mean, I just, it looks like it's from another planet. Doesn't it? So I just, I don't know, I just put that in there. Why not? It's cool. I wish we could see it right now. Climbing hydrangea, thanks to Keith Bradley. Again, if you're in the coastal plain, you wouldn't care. It's common. But in this, you know, you can find it in a few places around here. And you, you definitely wouldn't find it in most of the Piedmont or mountains, for sure. It's just another one of these disjunct, coastal plain, mostly types of things that we get in this region. And where is it growing in your house? I mean, what's the situation? 
Is it a bottom land though, near a creek at least or something? Yeah. Some yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it growing vegetatively in the shade, but I think usually when I see it in flower, it's at the edge of the woods or something where the sun gets in. I won't say all the time, but typically, again, where I find this, I, my spider senses go off, and I think, okay, slow down and start looking for other cool things. Um, and usually, almost always, I'll find something weird with it. But it's just a neat vine. It's just a climbing hydrangea. What a good idea, you know? Okay. And he said, oh, that's climbing hydrangea that's not climbing. So <laughs> apparently, if it doesn't have the opportunity to right. climb, it just... It'll ramble for a while. Yeah. 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 That's true. That would make sense. Yeah. That would make sense. Here's a... I've seen this flower on the edge of Lake Tocassi on a bank. Yeah, where the sun is? Mm hmm yeah, but if you were in Morganton or Rutherfordton or Hickory, you'd never see it. It's just not there. It's just not there. This is a bad picture of uh, an oak I don't run into a whole lot, Quercus Muhlenbergia. I think another common name is rock chestnut oak sometimes, but that's interchangeable with other, other such things. It's not at all apparent, but the teeth on that are more pronounced than your typical chestnut oak, and it likes basic soils. In the Great Lakes region, it grows on limestone flats called alvars, which are unique habitats with a lot of weird stuff. And to me, it's neat to see things I grew up as a kid growing here, but in a totally different situation. For example, black oak here in the Great Lakes region, it's, it looks like scarlet oak there. The sinuses are so deep. It's so deeply in sort of the lobes and such. It looks like nothing like what it does in the Great Lakes here, but the acorns are the same. So, I don't know. Behave. Adam Asco, not rare, but I thought that was kind of a neat shot of it. So, I like to see it. It's poisonous, don't eat it. It'll kill you. But we like that one. Ah, thanks, Keith. So, this grows on uh, Buck Mountain, Cedar Cliffs, if you know where that is in Polk County. There was um, a record of this from 1890s collected by a guy named Townsend. Petey references it in his writings and says something to the effect of, collected by Townsend to whom we owe much to our rare species or something like this more eloquently than what I just said hadn't been seen for a while. I guess 100 plus years is a while. But there's a bunch of it up there. And again, funny, kind of prairie it's right? But then sometimes grows in rocky seeps. I think like at Chimney Rock Park, for example, if you've been there. Beautiful plant. Stop. Ah, this is what Polk County's known for, right? Allegheny Spurge, it grows along the Green River and its tributaries. I think Greenville County has it, doesn't it? This is one of those species that's um, much commoner in like Tennessee, likes limestone basics, so that's probably why it likes the alluvial soils, I guess, of the Green River area. Flowers really early, like in the spring, super early, like March, maybe. Um, leaves are evergreen. I think Alan Weekly calls it, considers it a senescent species. I think he feels it's kind of naturally just kind of winding down, but I've seen whole hillsides of it in other states, so it looks like it's winding down there, but it's a beautiful plant. Just all the intricacies and variegations and whatnot. Only from Polk County in North Carolina. You all know this one, surely, right? Dwarf flowered heart leaf. So, hexastylus, without the flowers, we couldn't tell you what this is, right? But here's something I've noted. I've seen this in almost every county it exists in. It's a federally threatened species. Um, sometimes you'll encounter it in really big numbers where it is. And in places like Catawba County, the leaves are bigger and it grows under mountain laurel in ravines that are north facing, northeast facing, maybe even with some beach. And the leaves are bigger and less variegated. And in Polk County and neighboring South Carolina, it likes to grow around sort of these seepy springhead forest situations, often near sphagnum. I find the leaves are smaller and they're more variegated, but the flowers are the same, the same. So you could lose a lot of sleep over this genus 
if there was a new species just described, I don't know if you know it, um, it was described, I think, by a European worker. It's known from one population in Caldwell County, and he called it Asarum rosei, after Mark Rose, I think, or I think that's his name, the gentleman who discovered it initially. Its leaves look like Galax. He should have called it Hexostylus scalasifolia. So he described it as a sarum because the Europeans don't recognize Hexostylus. And when we were talking about it, uh, Alan Weekly goes, well, I'm just going to call it Hexostylus. So if he says that's good enough for all of us, I guess. It's a cool plant. This is another thing that's much commoner west of our region, yellow honeysuckle, likes rock outcrops, mafic rocks, amphibolite, basic soils, beautiful, beautiful honeysuckle. Um, I'm not sure if y'all get it down in this county or not. You might. Has anyone seen it? Yeah, that makes sense. But again, when I find this, I find other good stuff. This isn't going to be a junky area. It's going to be in a good habitat. And you'll have had to climb up to it probably or down to it maybe. Yeah, I think so. It's a nice one. Round leaf service berry, Amelanchier sanguinea, another rock outcrop thing that would grow with the preceding species. Um, again, more of a northern thing, Great Lakes, that sort of thing, but here it is. It's around. Early spring it flowers, and it's a good plant to look if you're into butterflies like elfins. Some of these things like pine elfins or brown elfins, they'll nectar on that. You'll often find some cool insects on that. Ah, I thought I'd throw that in there. Just <laughs> watch your step. That is from Burke County. But I've seen, photo I mean, I've, I've got a photograph of one from Polk County, but it's not that good. But it looks exactly like that. Now, for those who are familiar with timber rattlesnakes, they occur, did occur from Ontario, Canada, right down to our way and further south. In our region, we often call that a cane break, right? Up north, they're, they're black or darker, probably for thermoregulatory purposes. But again, it's, it's another one of these smoking guns of coastal plainness here, right? Why don't our timber rattlesnakes look like timber rattlesnakes? Why do they look like cane break timber rattlesnakes? They're the same species, but don't step on it. It'll ruin your day. Here was a good find. So not found in Polk County before, but near Columbus, a gentleman uh, who was from Pennsylvania originally, who knew them from there, gave us a call from one of the articles, and he said, my dog brought it to me in its mouth. I was like, for real? He's like, yeah. And so this is often how you just find stuff. You know, people tell you. Just another super interesting guy. And that's a federally, I guess, threatened or endangered species. These turtles like their feet wet and their backs dry. And so uh, a friend of mine, his name is Dennis Herman, he's a, a, an authority on these. He took my son and I up to Ashe County one time in December. He said, we're going turtle hunting. And I'm like, no, we're not. It's December. He's like, yeah, watch. And so we pull off somewhere. I, don't, I couldn't find it if you put a gun to my head. I don't know where it is, but it's in Ashe County. And we look across a field that looks like it's dry, like it's just nothing. But I saw some willow trees, and I thought, okay, there's some water there. And we go in to this field. He had permission, and he had the permits, because you know, if you touch them, and, you know, they'll sell for thousands of dollars on the black market for turtle collectors, they're that rare, thousands. And so we're, we pull up to these willows, and he sort of <laughs> pulls his sleeve up and sort of sticks his arm in, under there, right? And it's freezing cold. I'm telling you, it's cold. And he's like, mm, he pulls one out. No joke, I'm not joking. And I'm like, whoa going on here? And he said, well, I, I learned that they do this. This is cool. So it's cold up in the mountains, obviously, right? And the turtles are kind of underwater, and they, they do a neat trick. They, do, they get their oxygen through diffusion through their cloaca, which is a fancy word for their posterior hole, so to speak. So sleep underwater and breathe through your butt. I guess what they do, <laughs> for real. And he said what he did is he took the cloacal temperatures of the turtles, which was probably not much fun for the turtle, they were sleeping in there. Abducted and probed, alien abduction, turtles <laughs> will tell stories and not be, they won't be believed, right, by their peers. You'll be ridiculed. But anyway, this is the cool part. They sleep at the roots of the, the willows and the alders because there's just enough cellular respiration going on in the plant's roots to raise the temperature up just enough so they can make it. How cool is that? 
So this had nothing to do with plants, but whatever, right? <laughs> they live in bogs where there are plants. There you go. This I didn't find, but it, it's been reported for Polk County. And these guys live in little crevices, and you can kind of tell from their coloration that with the lichens and whatnot, the dappled shade, they'd probably do pretty well. And they like to live in right back in the crevice. Take your flashlight, kind of see them in there. Um, Oh, well, I'd very much like to see where. I don't disbelieve you. I looked for them. I didn't find them. That certainly means they're in Polk County. But if you've seen them in Pearson's Falls, was it in like a rock crevice kind of situation? The ledge, like, like ledge. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that would work. It has the rock shells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they get into trees. They're quite arboreal. They actually belong to a group of salamanders that are commoner on the west coast. And, and on the west coast, they get into trees. There's a theory that back in the day here that they did live in big hollow trees. And they kind of, excuse me, use the rocks now because the, the large trees have been removed. But who knows? They seem to like the rocks a lot. Um, and this, this salamander is like four inches in a bit. It's pretty robust. The picture doesn't do justice to how big this thing really is. So keep your eyes peeled for this. All right, I'll go through this fairly quick because I don't want to bore you. So here's the new plant. We think we found a new species of yucca. And it frequents uh, floodplains. And it grows below the rack line sometimes. It's underwater sometimes. It hardly ever flowers. And when it does, the, the stalks are 13 feet tall. I'll show you. I've got pictures. Um, and I presented this very part of the slideshow last year to the Rare Plant Conference in Chapel Hill. And it was generally agreed this is something new and odd. Carl Ross Petey in his writings mentions yucca filamentosa, which this is clearly allied to. If you know what that is, that's our common rock outcrop kind of yucca dry woods. He says, they grow at the base of mountains, which to me means they're near streams, and it rarely flowers, he says. So this is an odd place for yucca, because when I think of yucca, I think desert, don't you? Cactus, Arizona, just all of that. Well, this isn't that. OK, so here it is growing under rhododendron maximum with a creek behind it. Wow. Now, you might think, if you ran into that once, you might just think, oh, somebody put this here. Or, Who knows? It's a one-off, man. It's whatever. But we kept running into it. I kept running into it. And I thought, and then, oh, some of them are like the size of the front of a Volkswagen Beetle. The biggest yuccas I've ever seen. They're massive. They're big. You'll see. So there's some of it growing in Catawba County, but I'm including this because we found it in a few surrounding counties now, growing right next to a creek with river cane. That's not the kind of place you would want a yucca, a yucca wouldn't grow there. These plants are literally buried underwater sometimes. So that was kind of a hint. So they haven't been named, described the name yet? I'm in the process of describing it now. Right. Yep. And uh, here it is growing with Lakothui, dog hobble, right? In, in a floodplain. And there, there are hundreds of them. And look at that. There's like deposition from flooding on it. It's not a great picture, but you can see. And there's the creek behind it. And these are all different plants I'm showing you. There it is growing in the muck and the gravel root next to it. That's not an associate you would expect. There's a po population of them right near the creek you can see. And this is in Polk County. We found it in Greenville County, South Carolina. Yeah, this is all new. There it is. Now, this to me is a cool picture. I've put note abrupt line likely due to hydrology at Tove Slope, well drained sunny uplands, conspicuously lack yucca plants, which is exactly where they should be, right? And that's all New York fern growing in there with it. But see how they just stop. And you know, yuccas, when they produce seed, they're tiny little papery seeds, they'll blow everywhere. I guarantee you, yucca seeds have blown up that hill at some point. There isn't even one. They don't want to be where it's dry and sunny, which is where they should be. There's Dr. James Matthews next to one. Sort of gives you an idea of the size of the average one. Fairly, you know, it's pretty robust. And it's growing with, um, I'll translate, green dragon, spice bush, and moon seed. Those are all fairly basophilic, you know, circumneutral soil. I don't think yuccas tend to favor one pH over the other, per se. But those associates are weird associates for a yucca plant. And there's Dr. Matthews again. You can see the river cane there. I don't know if you can see, but that's quite a sprawling plant there. 
That is, a, that is a big old plant right there. So he's doing his measurements. That's like a jungle, isn't it? I mean, that's like a jungle. It's really, really dense. Okay, there's Pam Torlina. Look at where it stops flowering. Yeah, that one was 12 and a half feet tall. And when they do flower, I think in 25 years of whatever, we've seen it flower three times. Thousands of plants, three times. And when it does flower, it produces a large flower and the panicle or whatever you want to call it is very diffuse. It's not a compact yucca with lots of flowers. It's loose with a few big flowers, right? But that is tall. And the stalk is bare? Um, well, that one, it's hard to see because of the, the background isn't very good, but it, it produced flower but no fruit. So we were too late for the flowers and it didn't produce any fruit. Last year we were looking for um, yucca flowers and we found some on rock outcrops of yucca filamentosa but then rain came and destroyed them. So it's like, I think these plants, these yuccas are very long lived and if they don't produce fruit one year, they're like, oh, who cares, we'll be here another hundred years, it's fine. Yes? Mm -hmm. well, I'm so glad you mentioned that, actually. So we were thinking, well, maybe it's getting big and maybe it's being weird because of the wetness, right? Like the theory we were thinking, working with was, well, alluvium tends to be richer. The plants are getting more nutrients. They're just like big old plants, right? Um, it's wetter and that sort of thing. But talk about serendipitous luck. Okay, that's kind of a long one, but I'll... Can you see how big the flower is there? These people who live on the Green River dug up some yuccas from down below years ago and planted them by their house and it's totally dry pine oak heath. And the plants still continue to phenotypically look the same as if it was growing where it was wet anyway. So that tells me there's some genetic basis for what we're observing. Talk about lucky. Talk about lucky. And. Um, they were like, yeah, we put it there years ago. It doesn't hardly flower. And when it does, there's not many flowers. We don't like it. We want to move it. And I'm like, don't. Don't move it. Don't move it, please. 15 feet tall, crappy soil, just whatever, not like wet, not like rich at all. And it just cranked it out like as if it was in the creek anyway. So that's interesting. There's the flower. So when I showed that to Alan Weekly at Chapel Hill, he goes, oh, that's a nice magnolia you got there. He's joking. It's big. Isn't that big? And the shape of the petals and the sepals, to me, doesn't look normal. Um, we got lucky. That was one flower we got. That's the only flower we ever got. That's it. There's somebody's arm. So if you consult Flora of North America, which is the Bible for the nerds like me and others, the measurements of all these mature plants, not the babies, exceed the maximums in FNA for Flora of North America. It does have some filaments, and so it's got to be an allied species. We did some genetic testing. We sent some samples to Korea to be analyzed, and they indicated that there's a sibling relationship, but some difference. Um, they had some difficulty extracting the DNA because the, you know, the leaf is so thick, but we got enough to know. Yeah, if, you, if you were to pass a small one somewhere, you would see it filament and you'd just think it was yucca filamentosa. You wouldn't. Yeah, they're, they're definitely a sibling species or something to that effect. Okay, here's all the boring numbers, okay? So I did the numbers. We're not going to look at those. The numbers and numbers. Comparing, comparing. It's boring. Okay, the chart on the left will tell you something. That's the scatter plot. Orange is the one I'm calling palustrine yucca, the new one. That's quite a bit of, that's a statistically significant difference. Width of the leaf, not so much, but still yet some. But length of the leaf, consistently different. And you know, I think our sample size was, you know, maybe a dozen or a couple dozen of whatever. So it was a few. Here's the things it grows with. River cane, leatherwood, spice bush, green dragon, moon seed, New York fern, dog hobble, bladder nut, uh, magnolia tripedula, umbrella magnolia, right? Um, just why, 
right? This is not, it should be, they should be growing with prickly pear cactus, um, stuff like that on rock out crops, right? So consistently, this is across all counties, not just in Polk County. Here's some of the comp associates. Here's the map where it's found, plus Greenville County. So it seems like a South Mountain, Blue Ridge Escarpment area where there's a lot of endemism and speciation. If you look at flora of North America, some of the Western species are highly localized also. I don't know anything about Western yuccas, by the way, but I thought that was kind of interesting. Just, who knows? That's it. I'm done.